Thank you. For those of you out there that might be just joining us, this is the uh, America's Future Series. This is our National in Innovation Summit. Space Innovation Summit. Space Innovation Summit. You got it. And, uh, and we're delighted to welcome you all. I'm Scott Murray. And David, my friend, take it away. Well, I'm just thrilled to see Z. Hello, Z. How are you today? Now you got, I think we got you on mute. We have Zahir Evan, Ali Scott, with us. Thank you, thank you so much for welcoming uh, me to uh, our Space Innovation Summit. It's, uh, as always, truly a pleasure. Well, thanks for your support, and thanks for your leading this conversation. We're really looking forward to it. We'll get out of your way because uh, people want to hear you. They don't need to hear us. <laughs> <laughs> so much. All right. So um, today I've got with me Professor uh, Dr. Mazhar Ali of uh, the Technische Universität of Delft. Um, TU Delft, which is kind of uh, like the Caltech or MIT of Europe, uh, the leading or one of the top uni uh, technical universities uh, in Europe. Uh, he is uh, a researcher and um, uh, applied researcher of uh, quantum and fundamental uh, materials, uh, physics and chemistry. And, you know, today um, we're going to shift gears a little bit from looking at what um, the government needs to do, uh, specifically in defense, to looking at technologies that are really the futures. And there's nothing that says the future like uh, the you know imminent revolution um, in in quantum, uh, both in computing and in materials. So let's jump in uh, and and ask the question that everybody pretty much probably wants to hear about. Uh, Muz, your discovery of the uh, Josephson diode has made, uh, or superconducting diode, has made massive waves in the computing and superconducting world. What is that, sir, and, and why is it so important? Ah, so uh, first off, uh, thanks uh, to America's Future Series and, of course, to Zahir for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, yeah, so the Josephson diode, you're right. It, uh, it caught a lot of media attention, um, a lot more than, I guess, we, uh, we initially thought would happen. Uh, but I think that's because it caught the, uh, the imagination of people, because the basis of it is uh, superconductivity, which is kind of a Star Trek concept, right? The idea that something, a material, can conduct electricity uh, perfectly, as in without loss, right? You could build, in theory, a superconducting wire from here to the moon, and you would have no you know, heat generative loss of, of energy. Now, that's as long as it's superconducting. That's the, that's the trick there. So the thing is, superconductivity, which was first discovered in 110 years ago now or so, in, in I guess, in 1911, so a little more than that, it, uh, it's below where below a certain temperature, the resistance of a material suddenly drops to zero. But one, you have to be cold. And two, it was essentially uh, like a wire, like a metal. It was reciprocal. As in, if it's superconducted to the left, it's superconducted to the right. The same way a normal metal, like a normal wire you might use, conducts electricity to the left and to the right. See, that's different from, for example, semiconductors in, for example, the, the famous pin diode, right? The silicon diode basis of uh, almost all modern electronics. That's an example of a non-reciprocal uh, piece of technology where it doesn't conduct to the right even if it conducts to the left. Now, non-reciprocity, non-reciprocal things are really important in modern technology. It's the basis for active transistors, gyrators, isolators, things ranging from, from basically every piece of technology you use from your, your computer to the computer in your pocket, your phone, monitors, you know, wireless transmitters, where, wherever, you have some non-reciprocal component, okay? But they're, they have always been based on semiconductors. And semiconductors have, of course, a big drawback, a couple of big drawbacks. But one big drawback, of course, is that they semiconduct. Part of the time, they are extremely resistive. The other part of the time, they're somewhat you know, conductive. And now, when they're resistive, you lose a lot of energy um, because they, they just uh, generate a lot of heat. So a superconducting, a non-reciprocal superconductor was something that's been sought after for a long time, but something that was thought pretty much impossible for a long time, especially without requiring external things like an external magnetic field. So basically, we, uh, we, we tackled this, and we happened to, to figure out a, a trick, to figure out a way to realize this in a modern, 
a modern version of an older device. So there was a device called a Josephson Junction. Right. Brian Josephson, yeah, he was, he was 22 years old. He was a grad student when he just, he, he had, the story is that it was a homework problem. He has since debunked that. He said it wasn't exactly a homework problem. It was just a, a problem for his graduate school career that he was given. But he, he wrote down, he did the math on what happened if you took two superconductors and coupled them together across a non-superconductor, across a barrier. And uh, the idea is that, look, this, the superconductors are really quantum mechanical um, materials, as in they're manifesting quantum properties, not classical properties, at a scale that we can you know, actually take advantage of. Now. So, so the point is, he, he looked at this junction, and he, he did the math, and he said, oh, actually, you know what? You can get a superconductivity across a junction, across this barrier, um, depend if it's you know not too thick, and it can the, the effects of the superconductivity can be modulated by that barrier. Now this is all well and good, and it was the basis for the superconducting quantum interference device, the SQUID, which is the, the most sensitive magnetometer ever. But uh, you know what we did, we we brought it in a way we say to the 21st century. So instead of a classical material as the barrier, our trick, if you want to call it that, was to use a quantum material as the barrier. And a quantum material is essentially a lot of modern types of materials that have quantum mechanical properties, not necessarily old classical properties. And by adding that essentially piece in between the two superconductors, we were able to, to make this one directional superconductor happen. And, uh, and that opens the game. You know, now, now exactly analogous to old semiconducting non-reciprocal components, you can make superconducting non-reciprocal components, which means you, you have the possibility to do this at um, essentially a much more a much higher efficiency, even with the cooling, if you if you factor that in, as well as potentially operating at way faster speeds. So that's one thing that we're really excited to look at in in the future. Is uh, is basically we think this might be helpful to knock down the terahertz barrier, as in uh, be able to scale computing speeds up again using superconducting components. So, so this really represents a mainstreaming of superconducting technologies. Like we, we've all heard about superconductors, they can do all this cool stuff, but it's a lab tech. It's something that, that, that researchers play with, you know, um, maybe governments, you know, um, I think the Japanese built a test power line a few years ago um, where they put a, where they put, um, um, what do you call it? A, a Stirling cycle cooler on either end. And, 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 mm -hmm. and I think it was a YBCO, your, your, your PhD advisor, <laughs> Bob Kaba's famous right. material um, uh, that, that they ran across uh, and cooled to uh, uh, roughly 77 Kelvin liquid nitrogen. So that's minus uh, 200 degrees uh, Fahrenheit uh, Celsius roughly, just to give people a scale. Superconductors right. work at very cold temperatures, but, but this, is now saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, we can now take this. Um, yeah, it has to be cold, but we can now start applying it in, in terms of uh, building devices that can go in the field, that can go into, yeah. um, that, that can go into industry. Uh, oh, so absolutely. it seems like right. materials advances are, are really the key here um, to, to propelling a lot of these technological challenges that we've discussed, uh, I know you've attended a little bit of the, the conference so far, we've discussed a lot of technical challenges. It seems materials are always at the heart of it. Uh, right. What do you see next with materials um, in quantum, of course, but in other applications, you know, to broaden the aperture a little bit? Right, so there's a couple things there. Uh, first, let me, let me mention a couple things. Yeah, that's right, that in Japan, they're building those, uh, the superconducting levitating train lines. Right, In fact, right. Uh, they're currently, now the, there's a new one. They, they've completed their test. They, it seems to work <laughs> happily, and they're, they're expanding. They're building one, uh, apparently, to Osaka. Um, so it'll, go, it'll be a levitating train going under the water. Fun wow. idea, right? That's yeah, spectacular. Yeah. Connecting the island. Um, it works that well. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of applications of superconductivity, actually, that is, uh, is coming up. But there's a lot that in their daily life that people don't realize. Um, let me throw a couple out there. So MRI, right? Magnetic resonance imaging is a really important uh, bioimaging technique um, for detecting various problems in our bodies. 
the basis of that is, uh, is a squid, is a superconducting quantum interference device. Um, quantum computing is, of course, very, very popular nowadays and very important. And it's reaching, you know, almost mainstream levels, let's say. Uh, some of the big players, of course, are heavily involved. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of effort on various forms of making qubits. But to this day, the one that matters and the one that uh, IBM and Google and people are using is a superconducting qubit, right? That's exactly based on a Josephson junction. So MRI is based on Josephson junctions uh, uh, to quantum computing are based on Josephson junctions. So it's around, actually. It's just not something that people have thought about as much because it wasn't mainstream. But you're right that, well, in our <laughs> opinion, uh, you know, the advent of having non-reciprocal superconductivity finally, after you know, 50 years since it was first proposed, is going to change that game, is going to make this more mainstream because there's a lot more applications, uh, even more applications, let's say, possible. But, uh, but materials in general, um, yeah. So you know, I'm, of course, in the quantum nanoscience department here in Delft, and uh, I am in the quantum matter side. We have three uh, directions, quantum sensing, quantum matter, and quantum transduction, which is something I could explain later. But uh, in terms of materials, right now, we've really just started scratching the surface, actually, um, especially in terms, of the, uh, in, uh, in terms of applications of quantum materials. The last 10 or 15 years, really, we really started to get into it. You know, the graphene uh, was exfoliated, and maybe it was the first example of essentially being able to really start this research on, on modern quantum materials, although if you, whoever you want to argue with, start, it started, you know, with the first superconductor. But the point is there's a lot more materials nowadays that we can, uh, are, that are reaching that point where it's not just a matter of in lab, People are finding large ways to, for example, screen print large sheets of graphene to make that useful. But uh, people are also, uh, for example, sputtering uh, materials for spintronics, which is essentially taking advantage of other types of quantum phenomena. So I think quantum materials, of course, is one of the biggest, um, let's say, the most promising avenues because we're really getting a hold of that physics now and we're realizing that we can bring quantum mechanics to your daily life. And right. it, you really didn't. You, you did. People would say, yeah, you know, the, this, the transistor was a, an example of it, but not in the way that we're doing, let's say, today, where we're really taking advantage, essentially, I mean, I don't want to dive into too much science, but we're really starting to take advantage of quantization, <laughs> which is the right. quant part of quantum mechanics, right? Right. So that was yeah. really kind of a first order effect, the transistor. And now yeah. we're into the realm of what we in, as physicists think of as higher order effects, which are, we can, we can have more precision, we can detect things better, we can control things at, at more minute levels. And so we can take advantage of properties of materials that we simply couldn't before because we were dealing, you know, it's kind of right. the difference between having pliers and tweezers, right? Yeah. Uh, in terms of what you can do with, um, with the material. Now, now like, you said, again, uh, let me, let me yeah, give me, yeah. let me give you two points relative to that, right? Or relevant to that. So, the, one of the reasons we talk about quantum matter so much is because it's directly uh, involved in quantum sensing. Why do we care about quantum sensing? The whole point is that word quantum, is that sensing at the quantum limit, as in sensing just about as sensitive as our pocket of the universe allows us to, right? So that an example of that was essentially the squid, where you can detect down to the magnetic flux quantum, which is, again, the, the unit, <laughs> the the indivisible so unit of the magnetic, magnetic, field. magnetic field. Yeah, you can't divide that anymore, really, right? And, and there's other realms now. Charge quantization is one of the big things that we've tapped into in the last uh, decade, really. And we're starting to find uses of that all over the place, from dark matter detection for uh, you know, really scientific applications. But uh, you know, one of the big ones that, that is finding a home with some of these materials is lasers. In particular, there's always been a problem of the mid-IR range. Um, particularly to having a satchel absorber. So I heard people talking about lasers around today. Well, quantum materials is, is looking like it's going to provide an answer for, uh, for the mid-IR gap. Another problem has been uh, the, the terahertz gap in terms of uh, EM ra radiation. So people right, have been able to generate and utilize uh, gigahertz waves. And then we kind of have a, we have a gap from like maybe 
few hundred gigahertz to you know maybe 30 terahertz. And then above that, you're able to, where we've been able to tap in, of course, to optical light. But there's been a, it's been a gap where we haven't been able to have good sources. And uh, this taps into the quantum transduction route, which uh, very briefly, transduction, what is that? It's a scary sounding word, but you're using it right now, right? I'm talking into a speaker, a microphone, essentially, it, I mean, it is a transducer. Yep. Right. So what it is, very broadly speaking, is converting one form of energy into another, all right? The sound is launched to the pressure wave. We're converting to electrical energy with a microphone. Quantum transduction relates to this idea of saying, okay, look, I have, I have light in, you know, visible light in the few hundred terahertz regime. But my, for example, my qubit, that's down at five to 10 gigahertz. That's where qubits live and resonate. How do I connect my qubit in my quantum computer to a quantum internet? What is my quantum modem? How do I connect a quantum computer via fiber optic or some sort of cable to all the other quantum computers? Well, that's exactly a problem. And that's where quantum transduction comes in is saying, okay, I'm gonna take light. It's gonna hit something that's gonna convert that energy down into a regime and then oscillate at a frequency that talks to my qubit. And I'm not going to lose coherence. I'm gonna keep all the information and right. inject it. Like this is the exact analog of how your how the modems in your computers, well, now we don't have them, but you know, how modems work essentially to connect your computer to the internet. You, we need a quantum version if we ever want to do anything useful with quantum computers. So that's where transduction comes in. Right. And we still and use also as a base of quantum modem materials. In, in the fabric, for example, for high performance computing. Um, yeah. Which is, you know, and, and people forget, don't realize, but high performance computing is a critical aspect of our. Uh, of the backbone of our ability to do a lot of industry. Um, e everything from auto to aero to, right. to pharma uses high performance computing. So, so the applications of this are, are really across all industries. Now, now I know that your time is unfortunately a little limited today, but I wanna jump into kind of, um, you know, giving you the opportunity to, um, you know, ask and really talk about what do you think is needed in terms of moving forward and how to move this forward in terms of investment? Do we need AI? Do we need bigger manufacturing and testing facilities? What should industry and government be doing? You know, feel free to be prescriptive. You know, what, what, yeah. do, what <laughs> needs to happen? Because uh, particularly in Europe and the West and in, in democratic nations, right? We're in a cold war in space and, and right. in quantum, right? Anybody who says we're not, Sorry, you're you're you got, you're an ostrich. You got your head in the sand. This is a reality, and we have to beat yeah. our our near peer adversaries. So, what can be done now? What should democratic you know you know country companies be doing, and what should democratic governments be doing in terms of investment to advance um, this uh, type of science? Right. Good question. Uh, so, let's see. Maybe two things I will I will I would say. So, first is an attitude. And the attitude I mean is that this research is quickly, okay, in the scale of lab to fab, it's going pretty fast. You know, there, you know, you know the story of the the, let's say the old school hard drive took roughly, you know, 35, 40 years from the first advent of giant magnet resistance to like hard drives that, that really made right, it right. The platters, the big hardware. lungs of the IBM. The big platters. <laughs> that we remember. Right. Uh, you know, at this research on quantum materials and these quantum effects is, is going at a much faster pace. Um, and because of that, it, the attitude change I'm talking about is that there needs to be a lot of investment in a bit of an exploratory discovery side, a lot more essentially, because the material space is crazy large, right? If you do the math on 118 elements, and binary, trinary, and quaternary, just relatively simple combination. Yeah, yeah the easy stuff. Yeah, it, it goes in, in nuts. You know, you have 10 to the, somebody did a, a calculation a long time ago, just doing that. And they, they <coughs> quickly showed there's like 10 to the 20th possible material combinations at a, at a trivial level. So, so, you know, searching this material space requires, like you said, uh, you know, investment, in terms of exploratory research of based on people's intuition, but also AI can very much help. It can play a very large role here in, in narrowing the space based on properties because the physics of this is 
a lot of the physics is understood enough, let's say, that you can uh, put your brain, put my brain into a computer, you know? Um, and yeah, computer. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, you know, let's say, let's say certainly pieces of it are, are programmable because it's some of, we started to understand the patterns. And once you do that, they, you know, the search becomes to some extent, a pattern recognition problem, which yes, humans are exceptionally good at, but we also are understanding how to make computers good at, right? That's one of the entire points of AI. It's not a magic bullet. You can't just tell it, find me a material. You have to tell it, look, I have these, you know, eight, let's say requirements. And I know that these patterns seem to give rise to these requirements, search and find it that way. And that, that you can make some, make a computer do. So AI certainly has a role, uh, a very helpful role here. But uh, aside from, from just exploratory uh, research uh, and funding, like you were mentioning, um, equipment, uh, but also like the general was mentioning people. So I want to say two quick words about that. Somewhat counterintuitively, the research of the very small requires pretty big machines. And uh, they, they are often quite expensive. For example, I just purchased a new cryostat um, for my lab, and that was uh, not too bad. But uh, still, you know, it's, uh, it's uh, on the order of, uh, of a million and a, and a bit, a million and change for, for this uh, piece of equipment that's going to, you know, allow me to, to dive into some more of this stuff. So in order to, to facilitate this type of research, you know, you do want centers with lots of these uh, big pieces, relatively big pieces of equipment available for the material scientists to come and, and test their materials at. And so, you know, here we have the Kavli Institute for Nanoscience um, uh, in Delft, so KIND it's called, which is arguably the premier place on earth to do this type of research because it has these, this facility set up. But a lot of places need to set up more of these facilities because like you were saying, there's a, fair enough, there's a, there's a cold war going on in terms of the quantum revolution. Well, I feel like one of the, uh, the unrepresented parts of that um, is, is the, the quantum matter, is the quantum material side. There's been a lot of emphasis on the algorithmic side of quantum computing. There's been a lot of uh, emphasis on uh, the hardware for quantum computing in terms of you know, the qubits, which involve the cryostat and the resonators and all this stuff itself. But as I tried to impress upon you guys just now, the heart, the beating heart of you know, the quantum revolution is in fact quantum materials. So finding the new quantum materials and the right quantum materials, let's say, that provide the certain properties that enable those applications is key. It's, it's the bedrock. So you've got to push that. And America has the opportunity certainly to push that really hard. You know, we had the, uh, yeah, we certainly had, um, maybe arguably still have, but we had the, uh, the premier uh, research programs in the world on this uh, 10 years ago you know, like I said, arguably to now, but, but it's, le it's more arguable now than it was. We definitely were the tops 10 years ago. There was no, it was, right. second place was distant. So, so that's the attitude that I want to see come back is really pushing hard the quantum material side, which means condensed matter physics on the, on the material side, which means material scientists, which means solid state chemists. No, awesome. You know, you said, and just to wrap up, you said that if the 20th century was a century of the semiconductor, the 21st century could be the century of the superconductor. Um, give us, give us your 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 final um, future future idea for this. Um, what do you think is 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 you know, fifty years from now, are we going to have you know do are, are we on the road to room you know closer to room temperature superconductors? Are we going to have um, super uh, super compute super quantum computers um, based off of technologies like yours, the Josephson diode? Oh, right, right. So what I think, yeah, is um, while, while I do think TC is going to continue to go up the critical temperature for superconductors uh, in various forms, I'm going to throw it out that, look, ambient condition superconductivity is overrated. We don't need it, exactly. Uh, you don't need a room thing, temperature superconductor. You don't need it to move the We don't need it. Forward. No, no, we don't. We have high enough TC superconductors. I'm going to use that word. <laughs> We have superconductors above 77 Kelvin. 77 Kelvin is the condensation temperature for liquid nitrogen. 
Anything right. below that, you have to use liquid helium, and that's that's a no-no, as for many reasons, as we've, right. we've heard. So above 77 Kelvin, you can get away with liquid nitrogen, which is a lot cheaper cooling, and uh, and we got that. We have those superconductors. So that's why part of why I, you know in my group and at Delft we're pushing the quantum material JJs, the quantum material Josephson junctions, because we've got the superconductors aspect solved. They put the right quantum material in between. And maybe we can really start, you know, I think easily 50 years from now. Oh boy, easily 50 years from now. I'm hoping much faster than that. You know, maybe 10 years from now, we're going to see a terahertz computer based on, exactly. based on this sort of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and that will be, of course, game changing. Spectacular. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, uh, Professor Dr. Masar Ali of Technical University Delft, a Falling Walls uh, finalist, a winner of the. Um, uh, of the Sofia uh, Kovala Sky Award. Um, and, you know, as you said, it, we don't have to wait on quantum materials. We can do this now. We just need the right investment um, in, in this area. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you again. Take care. Scott, David, back to you, gentlemen. All right. Thank you, Dr. Z. That was, uh, or Dr. Ali, and, and, and to you, Z, that, that was great stuff. What'd you think of that? Did you enjoy that? Yeah, no, I mean, <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm, there, there are two fundamental places we need to go as a society. We need to go all the way down in the quantum space, and we need to go all the way out in space. And the reality is, is that they're related. <laughs> quantum materials are going to take us to space, and space requirements are going to drive research and development in quantum technologies. The, you know, it's amazing, right? If we want subspace communication, just like, you know, Captain Kirk says, yeah, well that's said. action at a distance, <laughs> and that's quantum science. It absolutely, all comes together in the end. Yeah, absolutely. And, and well I loved what the doctor said a moment ago. You know, 10 years ago, we were at the preeminent, and we may have lost some of that. We have to regain that, and we have to go forward further. Right. So I appreciate your bringing that to the fore. We have to regain, we may have to make the right investments and the right focus on quantum materials and quantum capabilities, as you said, and to enable our space exploration and commercialization. Yeah, yeah. yeah. to be really sharp that. about it, David, Mush shouldn't have had to go to Technical University of Delft. We should have had that investment right here, and he should be at Caltech or MIT, in my opinion. Well said, well said. <laughs>